Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here with you to celebrate and commemorate the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall, which, as we have heard in many very inspiring speeches, had and still has impact on what Europe is today and probably even beyond. We were witnessing how Germany, German politicians and the German people handled history. It was 30 years ago when steps were taken that still are visible and that still have processes, especially within Germany, that have to uh, be uh, completed. I would like to uh, thank uh, Mr. Donfried for inviting the Congress of the Council of Europe to add the local and regional dimension to uh, this. And I will uh, present partly achievements because I think we have to also be proud of achievements of what Europe, European politicians, European citizens have achieved. And then address some of the challenges. To some of them, uh, the responses also lie in the hands of local and regional politicians, but very much so in the hands of active uh, people, of active Democrats at all level. Let us look back to the year 1849, when in Paris, uh, the International Congress of Friends of Peace took place. And uh, most of you will know this famous quotation of Victor Hugo, who chaired this conference, when he said, a day will come when you, France, you, Russia, you, Italy, you, England, you, Germany, you all, nations of the continent without losing your distinct qualities and your glorious individuality will be merged closely with a superior unit and you will form the European Brotherhood. Well, World War I was not really a symbol of this kind of unity and war, nor, nor was World War II. And that's why in 18, 1948, in The Hague, 800 intellectuals and politicians came together and said, we must create a structure that overcomes the hatred and that reunites the, con the, co the continent. And it was only one year later, when in 1949, the Treaty of London established the Council of Europe, which was the first step to the family reunion, which was completed after the fall of the Iron Curtain within the Council uh, of Europe. First, 11 countries decided uh, to establish the Council of Europe. They were joined by uh, more, 12 more, so it was 23 in 1989, 41 in 1999, so the period after the fall of the Iron Curtain brought really a significant enlargement of the European family, and now we are 47 uh, member states in the Council uh, of Europe. I will then briefly introduce this uh, institutional special feature of local and regional democracy within the institutional architecture of the Council of Europe, the Congress of Local and Regional uh, Authorities and its role for safeguarding democracy at the grassroots uh, level. After the Second World War, and we have heard this from several speakers before, it was evident that absolute sovereignty and nationalism constituted a threat to peace. A new system was required to defuse conflict, rebuild trust, and ensure that war and persecution were not repeated again on the continent. When the Council of Europe was established, the first step was set. A political body composed of representatives of the governments, the Committee of Ministers, and a consultative assembly, now parliamentary assembly, representing national uh, governments. The core values of this Council of Europe are enshrined in the European Convention on Human Rights, an international treaty under which the member states promise to secure fundamental civil rights, not only for their own citizens, but for everybody under their jurisdiction. The convention entered into force in September 1953 and got real teeth thanks to the establishment of the European Court of Human Rights in 1959, 60 years ago. Yet the European Convention on Human Rights is not sufficient to ensure the success of the ambitious European project based on the values, democracy, human rights and the rule of law. This European project needs the assent of people, the creation of solidarity, not only between states, but also between the people 
and the creation of a deepening of a common European identity based on these values. Step by step, a united Europe emerged and Europeans endowed themselves with a European identity and with symbols. In 1948, the Federalist flag was used to symbolize Europe. The European flag, as we know it today, was officially adopted in 1955 by the Council of Europe as a symbol for all Europeans. And it was, it was offered to others who wanted to promote this spirit of European identity. From Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, the Ode to Joy was chosen as the Council of Europe's, now all Europe's anthem in 1972, hence becoming the second piece of identity that uh, was visible and feelable by people. Both elements were given to the European community, now the European Union, uh, who uses them since 1986. And this is why it's no surprise that if you go to Georgia, Ukraine, Armenia, and other countries that you see this flag, it is the flag of the Council of Europe, which also contains the aspiration to become, for many of those countries, the future uh, uh, a flag of their membership in uh, the European Union. The Council of Europe is a family of states and of course between family members there are sometimes quarrels, there are discussions and even uh, conflict. The Con Council of Europe had to deal with the political and ge uh, geopolitical uh, evolution on the continent, especially after the fall of the Berlin Wall, after the collapse of the Soviet Un Union and the disintegration of Yugoslavia. In these periods, the Council of Europe provided guidance to the new states and offered them to become part of the family. The European Summit of Vienna in 1993 took place in an atmosphere of hope. It was one year after the Maastricht Treaty was signed, so there was a big movement for this greater Europe, for having uh, new members. The European Union was enlarged a little bit later by Austria, uh, Sweden, and uh, Finland, and the Council of Europe was enlarged by almost, uh, by all, uh, by almost 20 countries from uh, former uh, uh, Eastern uh, Bloc. And it was at this occasion in Vienna in 1993 when the heads of states and government also decided to establish an organ composed of local and regional politicians within its own architecture. <clears throat> It was Helmut Kohl, who has to be praised uh, in these days also for other things, who uh, said in his speech to the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe on the 2nd of February 1993. So it is not just François Mitterrand and Helmut Kohl and not just Adenauer and de Gaulle who should meet. That is one thing. If they harmonize well with one another, this is not necessarily a drawback. But the decisive factor is that the mayors the councillors, sports clubs, and schools get together. And in this spirit, more or less at the same time, the Committee of the Regions of the European Union in the Maastricht Treaty and the Congress of Local and Regional Authorities in the Council of Europe were established, both celebrated in June this year together their 25th anniversary, and they are working very, uh, in, in, in a very good complementary um, way. In the third Council of Europe summit in 1997, already 41 heads of states uh, gathered. And the Warsaw summit in 2005 saw 46. Montenegro was the last country that was at that time Serbia and Montenegro, which came only later to complete the family with 47 uh, members. And there are uh, two and a half countries left that have not uh, joined the Council of Europe yet. yet. Uh, the two countries are Belarus uh, because of death penalty and uh, the Holy See, Vatican, because of a democracy issue, I would call it like that. And the half country is Kosovo. Half because half of our member states recognize Kosovo as a state and the other half does not. This is the two and a half that are not yet under the jurisdiction of the uh, European Court of uh, Human Rights. The uh, acquis of the Council of Europe comprises 225 conventions and protocols which govern 
a lot of the parts of our daily lives, but they are not very much uh, visible. And I would like just to mention a, a, a few of them. The European Convention on Human Rights is the one that is known best. It's the precondition to ratify this convention also to become a member of the Council uh, of Europe. It, is, uh, it was uh, set up as a universalist uh, legal instrument to protect citizens from the state. And this was also a, a revolutionary uh, approach that member states agreed that their citizens have to be protected from over action by themselves of infringements of the basic uh, human rights uh, and uh, freedoms. The Council of Europe has been a pioneer in the abolition process of the death penalty. Uh, since 1997, thanks to the adoption of uh, the protocol number six on abolition of death penalty, uh, the Council of Europe area is de facto uh, death penalty free. The European Convention for the Prevention of Torture or inhumane or degrading um, treatment of punishment is also a very important uh, element in protecting the citizens in uh, their rights. Uh, upholding freedom of expression is one of the core activities, and the freedom of expression are the corners, is the cornerstone of a public uh, of a democracy with a, a, a public debate, and we are very concerned that in these years, 2018 and 19, the Council of Europe had to set up a network for the protection of journalists again. So we see democracy, freedom, uh, and human rights, and uh, the rule of law are never completely achieved and have to be uh, defended at all times. The Venice Commission, the European Commission for Democracy Through Law, is a a pool of expertise for constitutional changes in our member states, and it is also used uh, far beyond. It's beyond the uh, 46, uh, 47 member states of the Council uh, of Europe. Uh, four observers and uh, one special guest is a part of the, um, of the uh, Venice Commission in large uh, partial agreement, and in addition, uh, 15 non-European countries, among them South Korea, Brazil, Mexico, the United States, and, um, uh, and Canada are uh, states party to the enlarged partial agreement of the Venice Commission. The fight against discrimination and racism is also something that is on, still on the agenda. 25 years ago, the heads of states and government decided to create the European Commission Against Racism and Intolerance, ECRI, and we are very pleased to have the Icelandic representative in ECRI uh, with us. And that is also part of this European model of society. Gender equality, lots of action and a convention, the Convention uh, on Preventing and Combating Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence, the, so-called Istanbul Convention is to be mentioned in this uh, context. Uh, convention on the Protection of Children, uh, the Framework Convention on the, for the Protection of National uh, Minorities and for Regional and Minority Languages, all issues that are more or less taken for granted but need this common legal background in order to be applied. Free and fair elections. The right to free elections is enshrined in Article 3 of Protocol 1 to the European Convention of Human Rights. And two organs, the Parliamentary Assembly and the Congress, observe uh, elections. The Parliamentary Assembly national elections, the Congress of local and regional authorities, local and regional elections. And you may have followed the headlines that our observer teams got worldwide when they uh, observed and reported about the local elections in Turkey in March and in June this year. Uh, it does not need only the hardware, the legislative measures, it also needs software, and that is the uh, uh, democratic citizenship. On this uh, area, uh, the education in human rights and democratic citizenship, the Council of Europe has prepared curricula for all its member states, and they are more or less consequently being uh, implemented. Fight against corruption. Corruption destroys the trust in, in democratic institutions. 
The Group of States Against Cor uh, Corruption, Greco, regularly publishes reports about the situation of uh, corruption and the prevention of corruption in all member states and also makes concrete policy recommendations. And last but not least, as an, as an uh, aspect of the human right to uh, good quality health care, the Council of Europe has uh, the European uh, Pharmacopeia, which, is, uh, which grants the quality of medicine products uh, so that counterfeiting becomes more uh, difficult. Many of these norms are made f in Europe, but they are not made for Europe only. Many of them are used in partial agreements, uh, in, in large partial agreements, also in other parts of the world. And in many of these activities, violence against women, uh, for example, gender equality, regional and minority languages, the local and regional authorities have a key role to play. So it is not sufficient if national governments consider the matter as important. If it doesn't work at the local level, member states will find themselves again in front of the European Court of uh, Human Rights. And at this stage, maybe a, a comparison, we, were, we spoke about the criteria to become member of the European Union. Yes, Copenhagen criteria before also being member of the Council of Europe. And when you're in, you're in. Almost nothing can happen to you. Well, until recently. The situation in the Com Council of Europe is different. As a member state, you say, I want to be part of this European family, which is characterized by a certain level of standards. And we know we are not perfect. We are at halfway through to achieve the level enshrined in several constitutions. And the Council of Europe offers member states the possibility to achieve these standards with monitoring reports, which are all public. They are all public and are on our website not enough used by journalists, civil society, parliaments, in my view. There is more to take out of this know-how in the Council of Europe. Uh, so it's monitoring activities and concrete support in the framework of action plans. And that holds true for all member states. No one should be as arrogant and say, we are perfect, we know. All member states are concerned. And for the Congress of Local and Regional Authorities, the special situation is that in, in 1993, in Vienna, heads of states and government entrusted local and regional politicians, mayors, councillors, presidents of regional governments and parliaments to monitor member states on their implication of application of the European Charter of Local Self-Government. So we do monitor national governments. We are very much uh, aware of this high responsibility, and I'm not sure whether in uh, after this really pro-local, pro-regional dimension in 1992, 1993, this would happen again. We are very conscious of the responsibility that uh, we have. And it was already in 1957 that then the Parliamentary Assembly established a conference of mayors within its framework. It developed further into a conference, in into a standing conference, and then in 1993 into the Congress of Local and Regional Authorities as it is today. It is a monitoring body, as I mentioned, a, a monitoring the application of the European Charter of Local Self-Government in all member states every approximately four to five years. Last week we had two interesting ones, one on the, uh, on the Russian Federation and one on Bosnia and Herzegovina. And we also observe discuss monitoring reports with recommendations to member states. And last week, our members uh, discussed and approved recommendations to the Turkish government, on, especially on the access of candidates to, uh, to media. That was the main uh, uh, issue there. Um, what are our challenges right now? Well, member states have decided they wanted to have the application of the European uh, Convention on Human Rights everywhere. There are so-called gray zones where monitoring bodies do not have, have access to. And within our remit in the Congress, the application of the European Charter of Local Self-Government is all, also not granted everywhere for different reasons. The Charter is not applicable in Northern Ireland. The United Kingdom made a reservation to include this territory under the 
uh, charter. We have gray zones in areas where, which are not under the control of the government. Transnistria, Crimea, South Ossetia, North, uh, the northern part of Cyprus, just to mention a few. So we will look into that to bring, like member states want to bring the European Convention on Human Rights to the whole territory, to bring local and regional democracy to the whole uh, territory. And we have to keep these uh, success stories that I mentioned before uh, in mind when we see that some things are also uh, going uh, wrong. Europe has been concerned more and more about its own internal security. Terrorist attacks were uh, re well, quite regular uh, in uh, the past. And on, on the other hand, the unorganized responses to the arrival of so many refugees and the imperfections in the integration policies for migrants at European but also at national level have provoked serious violations of human rights and created confusions on our borders. This, combined with the critical economic situation, resulted in insecure condi con conditions, shaky democratic institutions, and the rise of nationalists and xenophobia. And there, local and regional politicians are the ones who have taken initiatives, taken decision, and taken uh, responsibility, but on the long run, they need to do that in a correct legal uh, framework. Let me just also mention some of the, uh, n of the, of the fears that uh, I, I feel. What I find really worrying are increasing partly self-imposed limitations in the behavior in public debates. In the way many of our fellow citizens think of our values and not defend them. The discussion and competitions of ideas after the war and up to the end of the 20th century did not so much consist of dogmas, ideologies, and, think and thick blocks, but of a multitude of debates, intellectual provocations, drafts, and experiments. This approach is the one that shaped our present, human rights and democracy, the rule of law, would be unthinkable without this discourse of intellectually challenging the ideas of others. The nations have worked to create constitutional, parliamentary, and judicial sy systems which protect individuals and minorities from arbitrary uh, powers. Uh, I have the impression that the verbal commitment to the values of democracy, human rights, and the rule of law by national uh, leaders um, degenerates into a phrase and is not more than lip service in many cases. Uh, until a few years ago, I find that critical thinking and respect for facts were more highly regarded than opinions, perceptions, prejudices, feelings, traditions, habits, or dogmas. I think the European project, this European model of society, of unity in diversity, of subsidiarity, and of solidarity needs more participation of the citizens. And th this, par this participation of citizens will then change the political uh, actions. What is the value of our freedom if it consists not in having to know, if it consists of not having to know everything, of living it in its own, her, his or her own bubble of information where you get the feedback on what you have known already before? When you avoid an exchange and avoid an intellectual provocation? What is the appropriate response to citizens who sometimes experience their maturity as annoying, as freedom too exhausting, and equality suspects, and who prefer a perceived truth to the result of a thorough analysis and their own judgment? Isn't it so that freedom, equality, and solidarity are only attractive or enforceable if they are protected by high walls, barbed wire. If we consider this to the end, we would have to admit that we are only ready to defend our freedoms and our equality and our solidarity within these high walls, and we are not ready to share this luxury of high standards that we're living in with others. With the Council of Europe, with its legal instruments, the countries, the local and regional authorities, the citizens, 
dispose of an institutional uh, framework of a reli reliable convention system with transparent monitoring bodies, with political instances and a court. The Council of Europe is one of the pillars making the dreams, hopes and aspirations of those who have developed this concept of a united Europe even 150 years ago more real. It takes people, it takes humans to take ownership of this European model of society to fill it with life and to develop, it, to, to, to develop it. And it needs these humans at national, at European, but also at the local and at the regional level. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Kifa, for your speech. Uh, I would like just to ask a quick question. Um, you talk about some initiatives that uh, the, Consul uh, the Council of Europe is doing about xenophobia or human rights. So I would like to ask you about Poland, the currently issues that Poland are, is having um, related to the LGTB community. What a specific initiative is uh, the Council of Europe doing like in this issue? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, this uh, Tuesday, the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe held a thematic debate on LGBTI plus rights. And there were several questions also uh, to uh, our Polish uh, partners. Uh, and uh, the reply was not so clear. But on the, in the conclusions, the chair said that we will have to look more into that. Uh, and as it is local and regional authorities who have stated this declaration, LGBTI free zones, if I understood well, uh, the Congress has decided to look into this question. So we will probably send some of our members there, find out more, and then raise again the awareness on what it means uh, being respectful. Um, for the time being, and this uh, adds a bit to what uh, Guy Verhofstadt said in the morning, in the Council of Europe, we only have, let's say, the nuclear option if a country doesn't comply with the obligations from the statute. That means we only have the possibility to expel a country. Uh, this was considered not useful, and therefore the Parliamentary Assembly and the Committee of Ministers are currently preparing a kind of a code of conduct with green, yellow, dark yellow, light red, and red cards, in order to identify failure to comply with the standards. And that is similar to what is being thought in the European Union, a process where then uh, not only the monitoring reports from the independent bodies, and this is ECRI, as a case for ECRI, and I'm sure they will, this European Commission Against Racism and Intolerance, they will look into that uh, as well. In the Council of Europe, we are not sprinters. We are marathon people. And that's sometimes also difficult to communicate because the public wants immediate reactions. But I think this is a virtue, which sometimes is also a disadvantage that the Council of Europe has, that we don't react too quickly. It's a long-term or well, mid-term initiative, which, of course, requires a reaction. But it's a systemic change that we want to achieve, and not just an individual solution in a, in a single case. <laughs>